paranormal Karen. She's so spooky, paranormal Karen. Funny too, paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, and did I mention she's funny too? Yeah, cha cha cha. Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast. I'm going to pump out some comedy dates really fast. February 28th, this is when this is coming out. I'm at Brad Garrett's Comedy Club in Las Vegas. March 7th, you can see me at Mont Baker Theater in Bellingham, Washington. A uh, couple of dates added, May 8th and 9th at Wisecrackers in the Poconos. Uh, Camden, New York, March 14th. And June 4th through 6th, Waco, Texas. Oh, I can't wait to go to Texas and find the haunted places there. So, uh, oh, and I always forget to say, folks, you can go to my website and get a tarot reading. That's uh, my day job at KarenRontowski.com. So today's guest uh, has the best titles to books I've ever seen. I went to his website and I was so excited. Uh, he teaches creative writing at Ohio University and uh, Gotham Writers Workshop. He is a member of the Historical Novel Society and Horror Writers Association. You've heard him on Coast to Coast AM and all over uh, TV, Sundance Channel. He speaks at paranormal conventions all over. He might tell us some about that later. Um, and he has 12 books, starting with uh, the one that caught my eye called uh, Shapeshifters, a history because I've become obsessed with the Skinwalker Ranch. Um, John, uh, let me say it again, Kachuba. John, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> I love how you say your last name. Say it like a sneeze, Kachuba. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's so easy that way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, John, tell me, uh, first let's start. How? What is your background in the paranormal? How did you get into this field? Um, I, I grew up in New England, and I was always interested in history, and still am very much interested in history. And in growing up in New England, you hear not only the, the true history of the place, but it's very difficult to not hear about ghosts and not to find an 18th century or 17th century graveyard <laughs> next door to you, you know? <laughs> so I forget, I'm from Massachusetts. So yes, I... Yeah, okay. You well, know, there you know. So Right, nobody you, on you know the know West Coast knows about the Minutemen. Nobody knows about them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, they well they well they should. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, <that's really> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and so uh, part of the time um so that was always an attraction for me. And then uh part of the time that I lived, I grew up in Connecticut, and part of the time that I was there, I lived in the same town as Ed and Lorraine Warren, um, who I'm sure a lot of your audience would recognize. Sure. I, I call them the godfather and godmother of American ghost hunting, you know. <laughs> yes. Um <laughs> of course neither one of them are, are with us anymore, but um so I got to know them and I was invited to their house and, you know, had some conversations with them and actually wrote about them in my book, Ghost Hunters, which is, you know, one of the ones that I have. Um, but in any case, so my interest sort of started there, but I never really started writing about any of this until 2014, after I had moved out to Ohio, uh, and an editor at a, at a press in Indiana contacted me. He knew some of my work and said, hey, I'd really like you to do some stories about ghosts. So he started a series called America's Haunted Road Trip. Uh, and I did a couple of books for them and then edited the rest of the series. And from there, other books just sprung off because my interest just grew, uh, you know, because I would go to all these places myself and investigate them and work with different ghost teams across the country and things like that. And I just got more and more interested. And so I just started, you know, writing about it. And it's slipped into my fiction and everything else. So, well, so I'm haunted. Yeah. And Ohio is no, Ohio is super haunted. I've been to Ohio quite a few times and there's no, I mean, I think every place is really haunted, but Ohio really has some uh, stuff going on. It does. And, and people always ask me, why is it that Ohio does? And to your point, Karen, you're right. Every place has, you know, spirits and ghosts. I mean, this isn't unique to Ohio by any means. Um, but I think it might be that there's just a lot of active um, ghost hunting groups in Ohio. And so they go out there, they do the work, they post things on websites. And, you know, next thing you know, people hear about it and write about it. Um, so I think it might just be 
sort of caused by the, the interest that's already here among the sort of paranormal community. Right. right. And didn't, uh, one time I remember I was there, because I make little comedy videos, and as much as you're like, Karen, this doesn't sound funny at all, it was, it was there a, there was a serial killer around Cleveland that used to leave, um, behead people and leave their heads in baskets. Was that a myth, or am I, is that a dream I had? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I'm laughing, I know I shouldn't be laughing, but one of these days I'd love to go out to my front porch and see if the <laughs> FedEx guy left me a head in a basket. <laughs> right, <laughs> but you know, the problem with them is they just toss it up, you know, they don't right. place it. You know? Right, so. and it had the little, uh, uh, I always picture it like a picnic basket with a little tablecloth over it. So, but that, <laughs> was that a, and a bottle of uh, wine. Yes. Red wine. Uh, yes, did, right, uh, of course. Did, uh, was that a true, was that an Elliot Ness story or did I, was that a legend that I've read? Somewhere? Well, to, to be honest with you, I, I have not heard that story. So <laughs> I don't know. It, it sounds pretty legendary, <laughs> but, but you know, people are strange. So I don't know. It could be real as well. <laughs> okay. I'll leave that one there. So, um, so, uh, I, so then the books just started coming. So I want to jump into this first one, which is a little obsession of my shapeshifters history. And I like the way that's titled because it's kind of like, uh, well, tell me how you got on that topic. Right. With my, I have, I think, I guess five or maybe six, uh, five, five ghost books, you know, that deal with traditional sort of ghosts and hauntings. And I do a lot of public speaking, as you mentioned, in libraries and universities and conferences. And it seems like every time I, I go there and make a presentation about ghosts, somebody in the audience will always have some question about something that is not a ghost, but is usually, they may even say shapeshifter or it may sound to me like, oh, you're really talking about a shapeshifter. So I started hearing this more and more, and I just got interested and said, well, what, you know, why is there so much interest in the shapeshifter character? What is that about? <clears throat> so I just started doing some research and found out that the idea of a shapeshifter, uh, basically a person that can transform himself or herself into any kind of an animal or, in fact, even sometimes an inanimate object, and then back again into human form, this goes way back. This goes back to Neolithic times, if not even before then. But we have evidence of, you know, cave paintings that show what looks like a shaman transforming himself from a deer into a, a human and vice versa. And, and so I did that and found out that the shapeshifter idea has been in cultures all around the world. As I said, from prehistoric times up to today, where there are people that say, you know, there are sightings and they still believe in shapeshifters and these aren't necessarily people that we would, I hate to use the term, but that would be called, you know, in quotes, primitive. Um, you know, people like you and me, well, right. people call me primitive, but anyway. <laughs> you know, I, so. I, I reach for primitive. I hope I can get there one day. Um, there you go. <laughs> you said inanimate objects. Now, uh, right. do you have a story or a tale with that or a legend? A um now, I well certainly if you go if you look at um, mythology if you look at Greek mythology for instance you have Zeus who is like the champion shapeshifter of all time and he transforms himself into at least a dozen kinds of animals uh, and birds and whatever so those are you know those are living things but there's also records of him changing himself into what they call a a shower of gold and I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to call it a golden shower. Right. Well, oh, I just did. Oh, well, I don't want to. But, you know, That's literally okay. a shower of like molten gold, you know. Um, so now, of course, this is this is mythology. But we also have to remember that for the people of that time, for the ancient Greeks, mythology was not you know, uh, a myth or, or, or as we consider today, a myth to be something that's not factual. This was their religion. These were their gods. So for them, that was true. Right. So Zeus, according to their belief, actually could change himself into that kind of thing. And what I found for there was not so much happening in, um, I don't want to say reality, but I wasn't getting personal recollections or experiences of somebody changing from a uh, human form into something inanimate. But there was a lot of cultural references. <clears throat> and this book actually becomes a cultural history, you know, a popular culture history as well as just a history. So you look at something like, uh, Star Trek and the, um, the, the person Odo, O-D-O. Um, I'm not a big Star trek fan, so people can correct me on this, but I've seen episodes. He's a shapeshifter. And I saw an episode where he changed into, he's kind of a silvery sort of looking guy. 
And he changed himself into something, a, a liquid, that he was a puddle and then passed under a door and transformed on the other side into human form. So you have that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, you know, there's legends in Portugal about uh, women that can transform themselves into uh, some inanimate objects, and they may vary into what they are. A lot of times you'll hear that in association with witches or sorcer- sorceresses, you know. Right, um, cats. So, so yeah. there's that. Yeah. Um, now, you, so uh, also, <clears throat> this is a weird split, uh, because I also uh, uh, spit it out, Karen. It's very early in the morning, but I'm, I was too excited about this podcast. So people, the people, there's sort of the category of people. Is there also the category, I always say, we, we just focus sometimes on like ghosts and demons, and there's so much in between there. Do you feel like there's uh, particular spirits that can do this, or people? Like, uh, are there categories of that? Right. I actually do talk about categories. <coughs> Um, and I think, I think again, as we said, there are some sort of mythological categories, and that's kind of where the book starts in the antiquity, you know, the ancient times, in which the shapeshifters were always gods. So they had this power. They had this, you know, divine power to do it. But then as technology advances and, and science advances, uh, some of the old gods sort of get clay feet, you know, and society says, well, we're not buying into all these gods and everything. And so the, the, the idea of shape-shifting comes down to people who have sort of arcane occult powers, like, like shamans, like witches, like sorcerers. So now these are humans that have that ability. So it, it changes like that. Um, now I'm not sure if that's quite answering your question, but no, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's a variety of categories. Yes. And in terms of spirits and demons, you're going that route. I, I, don't, I don't think... I'm not sure about that. I know in Japan, for instance, uh, I, I did a lot of research on Japanese culture, and their ghost culture is incredible. They have a million types of ghosts. You know, we have a ghost. They have a million types of ghosts. And a lot of those ghosts are shapeshifters. Uh, and that's sort of part of their whole thing is that they are, because of their ghost status, they are shapeshifters, not vice versa. So, so there's a category there, you know, of ghosts that shapeshift. You know, uh, I don't know if it's the Japanese, but you know the term hungry ghost or hungry spirit? Sure. Um, sure. I had a friend that was very ill. She actually ended up passing away, and she had... Uh, she was a tiny, tiny woman, and she had a tumor which was bigger than her chest. By the time that, oh my gosh, yeah, it was, it was so horrific to watch. We had to help her sit up, and mm-hmm. some they kept telling me she had a hungry ghost, and we actually did a ceremony or to try and get rid of it. It, it all didn't work. But um, is that Japanese? A hungry ghost? It's well, it's Japanese, but it's also in other Asian cultures as well. I think it's primarily Japanese from what I've seen, but there's hungry ghost festivals held throughout all of Asia. You know, it's in Singapore, it's in China, it's in Japan, it's in Korea, uh, Thailand. Uh, so, so that whole idea of a hungry ghost is basically um, people say it's it's a ghost of somebody who in life was gluttonous, you know, but not necessarily for food. I mean, I mean, that's sort of the, the common parlance is, okay, if you're a glutton, it's about food. But basically anybody who was greedy for anything could become a hungry ghost. And in Thailand, the way they depict it is, is horrific. The, the typical, you know, if you saw an image or a cartoon or a drawing of a hungry ghost, you see a head, you know, a horrible looking head, of course, and then, you know, an esophagus, and then basically just, you know, guts. <laughs> and that's it. No arms, no legs, you know, that's it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the idea of the Hungry Ghost. And the Hungry Ghost festivals are, are big deals in these countries, you know, and people spend a lot of money uh, to buy offerings, mostly food offerings, to put in the temples to appease the Hungry Ghost because they feel if they don't, you know, the, they'll have bad luck, bad misfortune. The hungry ghost could come after them. So it's a real, it's a real strong part of um, Asian culture and in, in Japan, especially in some other countries. There. Well, it was interesting too because she was Asian. She was Korean, 
And, ah, okay. Yeah, and uh, actually what we were trying to do was to get the spirit into an object. Like it, my friend Tommy, he's a demonologist. Believe me, I don't try these things on my own. And he was trying to help us. He was like, essentially, you're creating a haunted object. But, you know, when someone's in that, when someone's in that much pain, it's, anything's worth a try. You got to you gotta give it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, uh, that's interesting. So, and, and of course, shamans or yogis, I always kind of feel like those are people that are also, um, uh, for lack of a better term, trying to use their whole brain or trying to, or able to access the things that we in daily life aren't really, uh, working on. So, uh, that would be, that would, I can see where shamans would have that ability or be said to have that ability. Um, what about gin? Well, I don't know. Um, I don't really know if they're shapeshifters or not. Um, I, I've seen, I've encountered a couple of stories, uh, mostly from the Middle East area, you know, Turkey and some of the Middle Eastern countries about gin. And and some say they're shapeshifters and some say they're not. So I don't, I don't really have much on that. I'm not even sure if I... I probably mentioned them in the book. I don't recall, but I don't think I did a whole lot on there because it was it was murky, and I couldn't find a whole lot of sort of uh, documented evidence. So when I say evidence, I mean even just you know stories and reports from the past. You know? Right, and gin seems like a giant category. Like it's not narrowed down. It's a it's a little bit of my uh, interest because it's Middle East and it sort of has a different culture to it. But it also right. does seem like a big topic. Like is fair are fairies under that topic and things like that. Do you cover aliens sort of in this? Well, I do in the sense of I I talk a lot about uh, the reptilian alien uh, shapeshifter theory that David Ikes has. Um, and you, might be familiar with that. Maybe some of your reader listeners are too, but you know, the idea that aliens, reptilian aliens from some star system came to earth millions of years ago and mated with whatever sort of proto humans were running around on the planet at that point. And so then created this genetic strain of, uh, shape shifters, you know, that, that can, that today, their descendants are capable of shape-shifting from a reptilian form to a human form. And the interesting thing about uh, Ike's um, theory, if you want to call it that, is that these shape-shifters have, over the millennia, figured out how to attain positions of power. So in his example, Queen Elizabeth II is a reptilian alien shapeshifter, as is Barack Obama, um, and as is many, many sort of cultural heroes, you know, um, major sports figures and entertainers and artists and writers. I, I am not one. I will just, you know, say right now, I am not one. So not a shapeshifter that, or a believer? No, in no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a shapeshifter, <laughs> nor am I a believer in this particular theory. But anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some of those, some of those videos on YouTube and they, um, or the, uh, there was one about Barack Obama's. Uh, it must was a Secret Service guy, but it was actually pretty much explained on how video works. That it that there's right. a certain second in there where it pulls the tape funny or something like that. Um, what when they is so is that bigger theory when they say these people are shapeshifters? Is that a bigger conspiracy theory that we're sort of under their spell or they're ruling us? Well, yeah, it is definitely a conspiracy theory. If you go to, uh, you know, David Icke's site, you will see that he he is big on conspiracy theories of all kind, of all kinds. And and this particular one, the reptilian alien shapeshifters, he even gives it a name. But they've created something that he calls the Babylonian Brotherhood. Um, and so, yeah, it's this massive worldwide conspiracy that's apparently been going on for millions of years. So I don't know how successful they've been because, you know, we're, <laughs> we haven't been taken over by any planet yet or anything. So I don't know. Um, I know. I but, lo- but, but I, I, I kind of love all conspiracy theories a little, a little bit. Sometimes they get, right. I hate it when they get scary or somebody tries something that, you know, uh, the pizza thing scared me in, in Baltimore when they thought something was going on in the basement. And, uh, oh, yeah. 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 That was yeah. a little, uh, we don't want to send people with guns in strange places. Um, right. But um, uh, yes, and I actually have a friend uh, who who had a girlfriend who was a shapeshifter. So uh, let me take a break, everybody, and we'll be right back to talk about that. 
From my podcast series, Conversations with April, April Readings is here. How are you, lady? Hi, Paranormal Karen. <laughs> How would you describe what you do? I'm a psychic medium, animal communicator. I'm also clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsensory. And clairfun. Don't ever forget that. You're always fun. Um, I get readings from you all the time. I call you when I'm in a pinch. What can someone who is getting their first time reading expect? I love to start with what I call your psychic inbox, and that's where we get to see spirit messages, energetic pictures, and any information that's actually important for you to know about today that you might not even ask about. It's what brings you to the reading, and it also creates a context for the rest of your reading. And then? And then you get to ask any and all specific or general questions about any area or relationship in your life, and we zoom in on that. That's my favorite part because you are so specific and one of the most accurate readers I've ever been to. Thank you. Uh, AprilReadings.com is where anyone can book a reading. Yes. And then at April Readings on Instagram. Yes, definitely follow, like, and share. And uh, my commitment is really that it's fun and that people leave energized and hopefully with a little bit of healing. And a lot of inspiration. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so I have a friend named Ryan Singer, very funny comic, also uh, has a paranormal podcast, and he actually had a girlfriend who was a shapeshifter. And it was very interesting because this is not a blatant thing. In fact, the way he described it, he said uh, that she... One, she finally came to, and she was from the Middle East, so it always feels like there's a little bit of a gin connection there. But he said, she said to him, kind of, don't you remember yesterday my hair was shorter and black and now it's longer? Or one time she suddenly kind of looked like she was pregnant. That's a way to scare a, that's a way to scare a boyfriend right there. Shape shifting, <laughs> pregnant, not pregnant. Um, but he made it sound like it was so slight or almost like there was some, hypnotic thing with it does that make any sense in in stories um it it does and and i can give you a little story that sort of i think supports your story which is there's a, a man in ohio named guy savelli and guy is boy he's probably 85 or so by now if not older um guy is a master in some martial arts i forgot exactly what the name is it's probably in a, it's a pretty obscure martial arts but he's a master in it, and he teaches people and everything else. He did a lot of work with um, special forces and some of these, uh, you know, Navy SEAL teams and all this kind of stuff, training him uh, not only in martial arts, but in sort of a mind control thing. There was a book that came out, and it was turned into a movie later, and it was called, I think, I, I may have the title a little bit messed up, but Men Who Stare at Goats. Oh, yes, that was a great movie. Yes. Right. So Guy apparently was the guy who um, set this whole experiment up with the military. And reportedly, he was able to knock down a goat, knock it out, knock it unconscious with his mind from like 50 yards away or something else. So where I'm going with this is that Guy says that he can shapeshift. And when when sort of questioned about that, I got a story from one of his students who said that he and Guy were in a bar someplace, and um, there was another fellow in the bar who had you know a couple of one too many, and he was belligerent, he was loud, and he approached Guy, he approached Savelli, and basically got in his face. I don't know what about; it's not important, but he got in his face, and he was about ready to you know haul off and and clock him, and then the student says that. I just watched Savelli. He said, I don't know what happened. He said, but I looked at Savelli's face and he said, all I can say is that it changed. He said, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it was almost like a tiger came through. He said it was bizarre. I stood there and watched it and I, I still can't explain it, but I, I was looking at his face and this animal, this tiger like animal came through. And he said, this big drunk guy who was ready to, to clock him just stood there and his face turned pale you know, and he just kind of started quivering and, and ran away. <laughs> wow. I need to then, learn that. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I know. What a great trick that would be. So, I mean, so what happens there? You know, you had the student who was watching that and saw that, and there was obviously some effect on this other person who Savelli was directing his gaze toward, you know? So to my mind, that is some kind of shape shifting. Now, can I explain it? No, I cannot explain it. Um, but there's some kind of, I almost call it a spiritual power there. Uh, and when I think of that, I think of some things that I wrote in my book about 
spiritual masters over the centuries who have had or possibly have had the ability to shapeshift, one of them being Jesus. Mm. And I took, some, I, I took some heat from that recently in a book review by, of all places, the Catholic Herald. <laughs> 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 I, I never thought I'd get reviewed by them. Um, <laughs> but but so, so in my book, I make some um, – I, I talk about a theologian in the Netherlands who has translated some ancient Coptic texts from Egypt. And when he translates this, it talks about, he says it talks about Jesus and talks about his appearance and that it mentions his appearance as being very different. I'm sort of misquoting it, but people can read my book. This is in Shapeshifters, that sometimes he appears white, sometimes he appears red, sometimes he appears old, sometimes he appears young. So there's all these different appearances. People see him in different ways. The question is, are they just seeing him differently, or did he actually physically change to maybe, um, I don't want to say ingratiate himself, but maybe to be able to connect with different people? Uh, Right. And and then there's these examples from the New Testament that I put in the book as well that show incidences where people who have known Jesus, who traveled with him for years, like some of his disciples, um, Mary Magdalene, And after the resurrection, after his death, when he comes back and he is appearing to people, they'll spend hours and hours in his company, and they don't recognize him until at some point he lets himself be recognized. So what is that? How do they not recognize him? They wandered around with him in the desert for three years, side by side, and they don't recognize him two days after he dies or rises. Interesting. You know, uh, that actually makes sense. I I really think Jesus was somebody. I believe Jesus was a rabbi that uh, uh, he had access of all his brain. That's what I think. Right. I think this is all that part of our brain that a shaman can access. Or um, what did the Catholic Church not like about, or the Catholic uh, magazine not like about that? Well, I, he didn't say. Uh, I, the example he gave was when I talk about the transfiguration of Jesus. And if people, you're, you know, if your listeners don't know what that is, really quickly, he went up to a mountain. He told a few of his disciples to come with me, but, you know, stay down here. I'm going to go up to the mountain, and you stay down here and pray. So he goes up to the top of this mountain. And, the, you know, the text reads basically that he becomes this radiant light being. It's blinding light. He's no longer a solid human being. He's some kind of glowing white celestial being. And at the same time, uh, Moses and Elijah, you know, prophets who have been dead for centuries appear alongside him. And the the disciples are going, Holy cow, this is incredible. And then he comes down after and basically says to them, how'd you like the show? You know, (laughs) (laughs) but so, so I talked about that and the comments from the Catholic Herald, and this is a quote was, yeah, right. That was <laughs> wow. that was the reviewer's comment. Yeah, right. I said, that's the best you can do is, yeah, right? Um, <laughs> so I look at that as an example of the shape-shifting. But, you know, also the Buddha, uh, at least twice in his life, had um, tr- tr- also transfigured for his disciples, where he too became like this radiant light being. Now that's, you know, the Buddha lived before Jesus, and that was a whole cultural way on the other side of the world. And yet sort of the same kind of thing happens, and they're both what I would call spiritual masters, if nothing else. So so what is that? Uh, Yeah, so the Catholic Church didn't like that. But to my mind, I don't see how it it denies anything. If they believe that Jesus is God, then certainly he should be capable of shapeshift if he can walk on water, change water to wine, raise the dead, (laughs) make the lame walk, the blind see. We draw the line at shapeshifting. Come on. now. Yeah, yeah, right? I mean... (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know, there's an interesting, actually, one of my favorite, because um, uh, I'm I'm the, a Christian, but I'm not big on the Bible because I feel like men have interpreted that and done what they needed to do with it. Um, but sure. I, one of the favorite, I saw a lady that talks to angels, and my favorite thing that she said was that whenever she sees Jesus, he's almost always with Buddha because Buddha's funny. I was like, (laughs) now I'm in. That's a great. um, I like that. You know, a little off topic, but um, because paranormal is getting so popular, and I also think it's becoming popular because people are uh, waking up, or forever to use the term woke, or things are happening, um, I feel like the Catholic Church is, they've always sort of guarded 
the, you know, their exorcism stuff, which, you know, they're always associated with it, but I think they have a lot more information that they sort of guard and keep close uh, that would sort of make them kind of be like, yeah, all this information doesn't need to be out. We need him to be like this, so he's very easy to understand or to people, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, or that he's, it says sounds terrible, he's an easy sales job as a guy that looks like this and just does this. Mm -hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We don't want to make it too complicated. Uh, back to your friend Guy, uh, which, by the way, that was a great movie, and they made it a comedy. It was sort of a comedy, but um, sometimes I think that's how they want information to seep out. They don't... Right. Because we can laugh and get the information but not take it too seriously. Um, I took a great... Uh, course at the Rhine Education Center with uh, Lloyd Arbach, who oh yeah, he's phenomenal, and he w- does t- a lot of talking about chi. And I don't know if it was Guy, but there was someone, a, a master, uh, that they did. Uh, they did uh, t- tests or uh, things with where he was literally pushing Lloyd. Lloyd is in the other room. He can't see him. And they're saying to him, push him to the right, push him to the back, give him a shove. And it was, and it really worked. So even martial arts with that sort of what they do with chi, for lack of a better term, it's pretty fascinating. Well, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think if you want to look at it, we, we don't know the capacity of our brains, you know, what we can do. Um, still, what, something like 90% of the brain might is still unmapped or something along those lines, you know? Right. And I and I think a lot of these abilities were abilities that we had millions of years ago, but we, we lost them because we allowed technology I shouldn't say allowed, but as we developed technology, we became to rely on technology and science and inventions and whatever more. And the more we relied on them, the less we had to use our own brains. And so I think that a lot of these things are just lost to us, but that some people like Guy, like Lloyd, like whoever, um, Jesus, Buddha, I don't know. I think, I think some of these people are in touch with that part, like you said, using your whole brain. And I think that's exactly right. They're in touch with things that most of us have lost, but can possibly regain. Yeah, and we've been kind of called names and put in a, you know, I think that, uh, here's my conspiracy, sort of, whomever, it's real easy if we can get everybody to follow a religion, not even one specific one, but everybody, you do this and everything outside of that is demonic, don't do tarot cards, don't do psychic astrology, all that stuff, to kind of keep the masses, uh, you know, under control, I guess. There's my crazy conspiracy theory. But um, when we, have you done any, uh, did you do any research on sort of like the Skinwalker Ranch or particular shapeshifters that fit into a category? Right. Well, I did, I did a little bit on Skinwalkers generally, um, which are, you know, commonly um, spoken about among Native American cultures, especially in the Southwest, like the Diné people, the Navajo, or uh, the Utes, you know. Um, yeah, so I did a little bit about that, uh, Skinwalkers. The funny thing is I was on Coast to Coast um, about a month ago or so, and I was talking to George Knapp, the host, and he said to me, what do you know about Skinwalker Ranch? And I said, well, I don't know a lot. I heard about it. Anyway, it turns out that he had written an entire book called The Hunt for the Skinwalker. Oh, I just listened to it, and I was obsessed with it, and I can't seem to get a hold of Colin, who was the co-writer of it. Somebody, he, I, somebody emailed me. Somebody That's right, co Yeah. Right. It was great. You're probably a better luck. Yeah, probably a better luck contacting George. But yeah, so he was talking about the skinwalkers there, and it's a whole different approach because what what that book revealed, at least at Skinwalker Ranch, was that we weren't really talking about shapeshifters. We were talking about, I, I, to me, it sounds more like alien ent- entities that are you know doing something out there. Um, but the Native Americans. In, in that area have been saying for generations, you know, uh, you're, it's been in their story, it's been in their lore that there are people, mostly you know, shamans particularly, who are capable of changing into usually a coyote or a wolf or something sort of canine for the most part, um, but who are, you know, murderous and whose whole intention is to, you know, create havoc and basically kill people. And so skinwalkers are invoked you know, for revenge, for vengeance, to get back at somebody. Uh, and it's funny because 
Native Native American people who have that belief, you know, they don't even want to talk about skinwalkers. They, you know, they're afraid to even mention them because they think, you know, if I talk about them, he's going to be on my case. You know, <laughs> right? And that's an interesting thing at the Skinwalker Ranch. I thought this is my interpretation, but I haven't even been there yet, and uh, uh, that it feels like some sort of portal or hole opened up. And th- now you got everything coming in. Now you got, right. you know, which is sort of even another. They, they in that book they talk about the one guy that had on, um, he had on the night vision goggles, and everybody else was seeing a light, and he was seeing a tunnel, and he was seeing things jump out of the tunnel. Uh, which right. Is, and that I, I really have to. I think I got somebody to talk about that podcast. But the Skinwalker was, uh, yeah, that was when the Utes. I believe wanted revenge. They had been moved all over the place and they sort of invoked this skinwalker and then it's the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't put that back. Right. So right. That that's, yeah, that's is bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, they must have some uh, up, especially up in Ohio, there must be a lot of native American legend or, or uh, skinwalker stories up there. I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't hear much about skinwalkers and the native population. You know, we went through a couple of different uh, populations here with the Hopewell and the Dina people going back thousands of years, uh, right up to probably the last modern tribes here were the Miami and the and Delaware and the Shawnee, you know, um, and, and they're still here. I mean, I know some of them, but, but I don't, I don't hear skinwalker tales from here. And most of the time when I hear them, I'm hearing them only from Southwest people. Uh, so I don't know. Now, you know, there's the Wendigo, which is a little more up in the northern areas here, northern um, Midwest areas and up into Canada. Uh, but that's not quite a shapeshifter, uh, although some people say it can be a shapeshifter. But I, most of the stories I hear is just that, you know, it's an evil spirit, not so much a shapeshifter. But Okay. And anyway. uh, um, uh, uh, I was going to say maybe they're snowbirds. They don't like the cold. They're down here with us. That could be. That um, could be. <laughs> what is it? What is a windigo? It's a. I, I've never heard that language. Um, a windigo is a. I, I forgot exactly how you how one becomes a windigo, but I thought it was that. And I'll you know people can check me on this or not. But I thought it was that if you had murdered somebody, you know, um, that you were cursed into becoming this horrible. You know, you in your afterlife, you become this horrible. Windigo, which is a, a horrid looking creature that, again, is like a skinwalker in that its only intent is to kill people. Um, so, like, you're cursed to become sort of this murderous spirit for the rest of your, well, for eternity, I guess. Um, which, in a weird way, would be maybe that's a hungry ghost. Again, I have to kill, 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 sort of uh, uh, yeah. keep going. Uh, the other thing about a shapeshifter, I don't know if anyone's watching, HBO has a great show on right now called The Outsider, where it seems to be a shapeshifter that is taking on, uh, that almost comes up like a doppelganger, where people are in two places at once. I, you know, I've heard about that show. I haven't seen it yet, but I have heard somebody somebody actually referred that to me and said, "Oh, you got to watch The Outsider," but I but I haven't yet. Um, but the, you know, the thing is, if, if a shapeshifter again is capable of changing into anything, you, why couldn't you change into somebody's uh, a double, you know, or be something? There's a there's a story from. You know, okay, I'll show my sort of classical uh, literary nerdiness here. Um, <laughs> look, the Tales of Arthur, the Mort d'Arthur, if you want to go back to those days. Um, and it's a story about how King Arthur is fathered, how he's sired. And his father, Uther Pendragon, um, has his way with, oh, I can't remember the woman's name now, but um, Igraine. Uh, Igraine. And the way he does this is by... Uh, having Merlin, the magician, change his appearance, change uh, Uther's uh, appearance into the husband of Ingrain. So while husband's away, Uther visits his lady, uh, and she thinks it's her husband, and next thing you know, Arthur is conceived. So that's shape-shifting. That's shape-shifting through magic, but it's certainly shape-shifting. Interesting. I wish I could shape-shift into uh, Jennifer Aniston. That would, that would be great. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? You know, we'd all, if, if we could all shape-shift, there'd be a whole bunch of Brad Pitts and Jennifer Aniston. That's all we'd see. Uh, uh, yeah, that's all right. And speaking of actors, I, I have a weird question when we come back. We'll take a break. We'll be right back with John Kubach. Kubach, right? 
Oh, no. Kachuba. Kachuba. I got too God excited. bless you. <laughs> Kachuba. Okay. I got too excited. Hold on, folks. We'll be right back. We all live busy lives. In fact, when I'm not podcasting, ghost hunting, performing stand-up comedy, or reading tarot for my clients, I'm trying to catch my breath and de-stress. All that on the go can really play havoc with your sleep and impact your health. That's why I'm so crazy about the relaxing benefits of CBD oil. But I care about what I put into my body, so I only look for the best. And that's how I found Zion Medicinals. The company was founded by Brian Caruso, who sought a natural pharmacy-grade solution for his wife's pain and insomnia. Zion Medicinals sources high-quality, healthcare-grade, premium hemp oil direct from an organic farm in Colorado, so you consistently get the best product every single time. The oils are full spectrum too, not CBD isolate, which means that every bottle contains all of the plant's naturally occurring compounds, including cannabinoids, flavonoids, and oils for a superior product. Every bottle is third-party tested to ensure it's pure and potent too. To get your Zen with Zion, check them out online at zionmedicinals.com. Tell them I sent you and use coupon code KAREN20 for 20% off your first order. That's capital K, small A-R-E-N 20. Tell them Karen sent you. Okay, John, so I always feel like uh, really great actors are channeling. And uh, I know that's a little different than shape-shifting, but I almost think it's a, like when you, there are certain actors that they really become the person, for lack of a better uh, uh, thing, like uh, Benicio Del Toro almost looks like different people. So I feel like there's maybe a, a shape-shifting in there. I know some of it's makeup, but I think some, I uh, there are some characters that that just um, I can't think of a anyone off top, but you know what I mean. Somebody that is so embodied by the character, they almost look different. Yeah, I do, and I and I've wondered about that myself. I know um, I have a little bit in my uh, book about Japanese theater, uh, like from the seventeenth, eighteenth, seventeenth century, where all the roles were played by men. You know, even the women's roles and everything else. Uh, not unlike Shakespeare, who had young boys frequently play the part of women, you know. Um, but so in the Japanese theater, you know, the, the guy would spend an enormous amount of time creating this elaborate, you know, painting this elaborate face of a woman or whatever on, on his own face. I think. But then becoming so um, uh, so engrossed in that role that for every practical purpose, he would be that woman. And in fact, he would play that role for life. You wouldn't play in any other roles. Um, so, you you know, what does that say? If you get so much into the role that you play this one role of this one particular female all your life and you're a male, um, and that's not anything about like being transgender or anything else. I mean, this is a, 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 a male who is just, um, acting as a woman, but he gets so into that role that, that he doesn't change. And, and I think you're right. There are certainly actors and actresses who, it's not just the lines they speak or anything else, but there's something about getting into character and staying in character. And I, I think it, I think it affects you in some ways. I mean, I think if you are somebody really intently studying another person to be that person, I think almost naturally you're going to take on some of the characteristics. Now, whether, whether you take the physical characteristics or not, I don't know. It, it it does seem like sometimes they do that. They sometimes, boy, he even looks like that guy. <laughs> yeah, and and I a lot of my friends are actresses, and um, they're almost all of them are intuitive and psychic. It, and others probably just aren't aware or aren't thinking that, but they, mm-hmm. you know, that is sort of the emotional, that stereotype that some of them may be overly emotional or dramatic, but yeah, I think they, they, it's sort of like there's pieces of other people there. And I don't mean that in a creepy way. That's a good actor right. and they can shake it off. I'm sure somehow, but I'll never forget, uh, you know, Patrick Swayze did a movie where he played a transgender or a drag queen or something. And he went on let and it was almost like he couldn't stop talking in the dialect of uh, mm. uh, and it was I remember seeing that and thinking what happened there and I feel like he was so kind of overtaken with it that he really couldn't turn it off at that time um, so uh, now can you tell us some really interesting myths or shapeshifter stories 
Yeah, well, okay, so so there's one from Africa that uh, is is very very bizarre, and it's recent. I'm trying to think exactly. It was a newspaper account. And I think it came from like at least ninety six, if not later, maybe even up into two thousand, two thousand two, something like that. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the country, and I'm drawing a blank, but it's irrelevant because it's in the book. So <laughs> buy read the, the book, book everybody. Uh, <laughs> buy the book. Yeah, not that I'm plugging the book, but please buy the book. Oh, please um, <laughs> slug the book away. Yeah. Slug away. <laughs> So, so this guy wakes up in his house. It's in a little village in Africa. He wakes up because he hears this scratching kind of banging at his door, right? So he opens the door, and what he finds is he finds this, this giant bat, like, hanging off the door frame. And it was, like, trying to get in the house, it was, like, scratching or whatever. So obviously alarmed, he grabs a, a club or something that he had, and he starts, you know, he starts whacking at this bat, and it, it flies off, and he's obviously wounded. It's kind of flying off with, like, you know, a broken wing or something, and it flies off into the dark. Um, so he runs out and gets the rest of the village. He's all upset. He says, my gosh, there's this, there's this giant bat that just attacked my house. I don't know what it's about, you know? So a couple of people come up, you know, with him, and they, they chase this thing. And they find it on the ground, and it's like dragging itself uh, along the ground. And so um, the guy with the who whose house it was, he still has his club, and he starts beating the thing again. And next thing you know, it, it lays still, and it looks like it's dead. Well, as they're standing there, and this is a newspaper account, as they're standing looking at this dead bat-like thing, which is a pretty large bat, it starts transforming according to the story in the newspaper account. It starts transforming into what first looks like a child, and then it continues to transform, and it ends up transforming into an old man who the villagers recognize as an old man who they considered a wise man, like a shaman of their village. Well, he's dead because the guy killed him. So the guy goes to trial, and um, he's obviously found guilty for murder. Uh, but the judge says, you know, it's almost comical. He said, you really should be able to know the difference between a, a bat and an old man. But, you know, um, he, he yeah. kills this guy. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's a story. There's another story that was reported in the New York Times from uh, Uttar Pradesh up in India, which is a kind of remote province of India. It's pretty north and it's uh, pretty impoverished. And it was a story there, and I again, this was reported in the New York Times, and I think it was around 2005 or so. So it's, again, fairly recent, where 33 children were reported missing, uh, just, just snatched and taken away. And uh, the villagers were seeing, uh, they were saying that they were seeing some kind of a, they were calling it a wolf, a large wolf that was taking these kids away and, and you know killing them and they didn't find the kids. Uh, so they, there was investigations up there because what was happening was the villagers were starting to accuse each other of doing this, like how you know you're killing our kids and you must be a, a, an evil shaman or something. And they lynched 15 different villagers. Wow. For yeah, for apparently you know being shaman or, or yeah, I guess what would you call it, evil witches or something that were taking the kids. Well, they, the disappearances continued even after that. Um, a New York Times reporter went up there and he was talking to some people and he interviewed a girl who was like ten years old, and she said that she saw her little brother. It's like four or five. She said I saw him snatched away. She said this thing. She said it was a big wolf thing, but it wasn't a wolf because it ran on two legs. And it took him and threw him over its shoulder and ran off into the woods or jungle, you know, with my brother. Of course, he was never seen again. And his, her uncle, the woman's uncle, the little girl's uncle, was a truck driver. And he said, oh, he said, I've seen this thing. And he said, uh, the government wants us to say that it's a wolf. But we know better. We know that it's a man wolf. He called it a man wolf rather than a wolf man, but a man wolf, like a werewolf. Um, so he said, that's what's, that's what's bothering. That's what's taking our children. And then it just stopped as as soon as as quickly as it had started, it stopped, and nobody to this day knows who it was or what happened to the kids or or what it was that was taking them. And the kids um, never showed up again. No, 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 they're gone. Thirty three kids. So, um, so these are stories. I mean, these are you know shapeshifter stories. And the reason why I brought those out is because they're they're modern, they're recent, and there are there are still obviously people citing shapeshifter experiences all around the world. Um, in England, there's been some accounts from the late 1980s, 1990s of 
what they're calling werewolves. There's one they call Old Striker <clears throat> that they have seen actually, a guy said, I actually saw it transforming. Um, just There was a, a fence, and it was running towards the fence as a man, and when it got within you know, 10 feet of the fence or something, it started to transform into a wolf, and it jumped an eight-foot fence and then jumped across an irrigation canal, a 30-foot wide drainage ditch. <clears throat> so, <Wow>. it's in- <laughs> so there's those stories. Yeah, it's interesting that they all sort of surround around a wolf, which was actually <clears throat> sort of the lead-in to the Skinwalker Ranch, was it was a giant kind of wolf. That, That's right. That I and they were sort of entranced by it, which you know I wonder if uh, when that shape shifting goes on, if it's uh, I'm going to get real crazy now, but I wonder if it's almost like jumping a timeline, like the thing jumps a timeline where it's this and then it comes back to that. I know when um, when in Lloyd's class when he was talking about spoon bending, it wasn't about like forcing it with your mind. It was about like seeing the spoon already bent. Like you were jumping a timeline where the spoon was already bent. Um, But I find that interesting that it's always a wolf. And, you know, this all, it's kind of funny um, when things all tie together because that account, even to the 33 kids disappearing, that sounds reminiscent of what's going on in the national parks with the missing 411. It's the one, uh, I'm sure you know the the people disappearing in parks, but right. the there's one account, and I can't remember on which of this guy's movies or books, where one girl returned, one little girl was returned, and she again described a big sort of dog man that ran on two legs. That's- right, and there's been sightings of those um, fairly recently up in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, Wisconsin, thing they call a dog man. Um, yeah, not, not that I know of taking anybody, but they've seen this thing, you know, running around. So, you know, interesting, if you think about it, the very first animal that man was able to communicate with and domesticate was the wolf, right? And the domesticated breeds of wolf became dogs. Um, and if you think about a dog versus a wolf, I mean, a dog has an affinity for human beings. So somehow there's been a transformation in a wolf to make itself into the dog breeds that are that have an affinity for mankind, whereas the wolf still doesn't. But I'm wondering if that affinity doesn't in some way affect a wolf species, or if maybe there weren't wolves that somehow this is really crazy now. Now we're getting into woo woo land it. here, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean could could a wolf speak could wolves in addition to becoming domesticated, obviously they didn't all become domesticated. We still have wild wolves. So could they have maybe somehow developed a different type of affinity that allows them to Stay rather than be a domesticated dog that is kind of like a human on four legs in some way, could they have become a, can they have become a domesticated, can they have domesticated a human? <laughs> right. So that, yeah, I, you know what I mean? I have, a, a, my best friend's an animal communicator, and sometimes we will find lost dogs. And we definitely feel like dogs are interdimensional, right down to a story of a, a dog that the, the mom put the sweater on the dog. Uh, the dog ran off. She didn't get the leash on fast enough. Three months later, the dog comes back with the sweater on clean. Like, no, like he hasn't been so and so somebody would have had to take the dog, feed the dog, take care of the dog for three months, put the sweater back on and just let him go. And we, or the dog just found a laundromat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> One of those where you can jam it with pennies instead of actually paying. Um, and that's from my college right. days. Uh, but it is also um, I find that th- that is interesting with the dog. Uh, you know, there's a, I think people can look this up, but certain scientists have found that our DNA is actually closer to a dog than an ape. That's interesting. Yeah, that I didn't know. Maybe we're, uh, uh, maybe they are closer to us. It's very interesting in Tarot the Moon card. It's a very specific that you have your wolf side and you have your dog side. Um, very specific. Right. Right. Do, do, um, do, is there any good stories like shapeshifters that run in at the last minute and save somebody or something like, or somebody falling in love with a shapeshifter as it, you know, something weird, weird like that? 
Well, you know, fairy tales have that, right? I, I mean, if you think of Beauty and the Beast, for instance, yeah. um, there's this love story, right, with a, with a beast. Now, why is he a beast? He wasn't always a beast. He was a, he was a handsome prince, right? But he was, I forgot exactly why, but he was cursed. You know, a witch cursed him and made him into a beast. I, well, <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I say, so, I mean, so, so what is it? Belle, I don't even know what her name is, but, you know, falls in love with this, uh, with this beast and can see through that, you know, facade and see the real, and because of her love, he gets transformed back to a handsome prince again. So it's certainly in fairy tales. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about other instances, but, you know, those, those are kinds of legendary stories. Shapeshifters are not always evil. And I think that may be what the Catholic church was upset about or the, the reviewer with my book. I think he fell into that mindset that if you're a shapeshifter, if you're, co- if you're capable of a transformation, you must be diabolical. You must be demonic. You must be a werewolf, a vampire, which is you know totally a ridiculous assumption, but you know. Right. I know, you know, it's very funny because, uh, uh, I actually did a show. I used to do a show, or some, I still do, uh, with the, my friend that's the animal communicator. And um, we w- will do a show. We're both stand ups. We do an hour of stand up. Then we take questions from the crowd and make them funny. I do tarot. She does animal communication. Well, we uh, someone rented out a venue for us to do it. And we it was alongside a church, or this church owned that company. I'm on the plane ready to do go do the show that night. And I get a phone call. The parishioners are furious. They will not have tarot cards in that they will leave the church if you bring... And it's sort of that, that's almost kind of that barbaric, you know, you're afraid of pieces of paper, you know? Right, right. uh, And I have a little bit about a Ouija board who, next week, folks, we're having on a Ouija board expert. Um, But, you know, it's, I always find it very funny. You never see Beauty and the Beast reverse. You never see the woman as the beast, like a handsome guy walking around. It just wouldn't sell. That's right. (laughs) That's right. <laughs> that's just not. That's just not a good story. Um, so, so they really don't fall into a category or evil or not evil because that story about the old man, uh, that's almost interesting. Uh, that he didn't. I don't know. That's was he. I wonder what that. Uh, that's an interesting story. Was he trying to scare the guy? You show up as a bat. You certainly have an intention. Right. That's the thing. We don't know. We don't know what that was all about. I mean, to your point, yeah, I think, I think he may have had some intention as a bat and maybe, you know, deliberately toward this particular person too. We don't know. Um, and the villagers considered him a shaman. So he's somebody that they already are sort of wary of, you know, well, we don't know about shamans. You trust them, but you don't trust them. And, you know, so there could have been that. Um, but yeah, I mean, shapeshifters are not, not always evil. And I, in my book, I have, um, stories, uh, like from Italy and some other areas in Europe where there are shape-shifting fairies and shape-shifting sprites and these other sort of, you know, ethereal kind of entities that can shape-shift, but they frequently do good things as shape-shifters. You know, they're not necessarily evil at all. Um, but we we sort of got into that mindset because when you think of shape-shifter, the quintessential shape-shifter you think of as a werewolf. Right. And there hasn't been a whole lot of positive things to say about werewolves, you know, <laughs> or vampires. You know? So, <clears throat> and, and that's what you think of, you know. Right, right. Wow, that is fascinating. You know, I uh, I'm a kind of a uh, uh, I had an experience with a bad fairy, so I I really have to get somebody on the show that talks positively about fairies because I know those stories are out there. Uh, well, John, this has been fantastic. So tell people uh, where they can get this book and just give us an overview. Your other books look fantastic. You have like uh, the Ghost of Ohio, and there was one as I pull it up on my computer that I found super interesting which was the one uh, about the women, hang on, it's called uh, Women of the Way? Women of the Way, yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, my most of my books in print, you can get, you can, first of all, you can get anything on Amazon, so they're up there. Uh, but Shapeshifters, which just came out in June of last year, uh, that should be in probably your local bookstores. You should be able to find it, I think, pretty much. But if not, you know, it, it can be gotten from Amazon. People can go to my website, which is johnkachuba.com, really simple. And I have a book tab there. All my books you can get by just you know clicking on that tab, and it'll take you to Amazon or to the publisher, direct, or whatever. <clears throat> so there's no problem getting it. Women of the Way is um, interesting because it has nothing to do with the paranormal. It's a historical novel 
about three women in first century Judea, um, with the uh, as Christianity is coming into into play. Jesus is out there, and they're basically followers of Jesus. But I think I tell a story that um, is, I hope, probably more accurate historically as to what the role women really played in terms of the rise of Christianity. Oh, uh, they that. usually have a pretty much, yeah, they usually have pretty much a backstory, like they're, they're reformed whores. Right. pretty much all they are. <laughs> Aren't you know? we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> and I, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> And you know, so and and that's an ebook, so that's easy to get to, you know. But um, yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there's a paranormal novel called Dark Entry, which is based on an actual location in Connecticut that was supposedly haunted. Um, so there's a lot. And there's the Ohio books. Uh, there's a book about Illinois. There's a book about ghost hunters generally, which I like because that talks about people like Ed and Lorraine Warren. Talks about Marianne Winkowski, who was the real ghost whisperer upon whom the TV show was based. Um, has interesting chapters like, you know, how to buy a haunted house, <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know, love, or I what love. to do if you have a haunted house. Right. <laughs> you know? I always say, if you so. have a place and it costs ten bucks, there's probably going to be trouble. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, the, a good rule of thumb. <laughs> yes, and, and the Savage Apostle. <laughs> oh, the Savage Apostle again is a historical novel. Um, about the about early well actually it's, it's your old stomping grounds it's right. about the Plymouth Colony 17th century and it's the events that led up to what was known as King Philip's War and again people in California won't have a clue as to what that is because <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot of people in Massachusetts don't even know what that is um, <clears throat> but you know this was basically what I consider a a war based on religious and racial intolerance between English colonists and the native peoples there. Um, I I like that book, but anyway, so they're yeah. all they're all great, and everybody, it's johnkachuba dot com j o h n k a c h u b a. I will also have it in the show notes. You know, it's funny, John. The um, literally comics always do the difference between L A and New York, but there is one huge difference about people in California, which is they have no idea what a garage is for. They they <laughs> it's it's like a storage space. No one. I I'm always like, I always like to live in guest houses and I always, what's important is a parking spot. And I'm always like, is there a garage? Sure. We have right. a garage. You can't park in it. Why would you put a car in a garage? And in New England, <laughs> it's like, get my car out of the snow. Um, right. Well, that is, thank you so much, John, for taking the time. And, uh, and, uh, please, anytime your blog posts are fantastic, everybody go check it out. John Kachuba.com. J O H N K A C H U B A. And, uh, grab a book. They're just fantastic. Well, thank you, Karen. It's been a pleasure being on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Great. And everybody, you can find me at KarenRontowski.com or ParanormalKaren.com. Also, follow me on Instagram, at Rontowski. And uh, what else? I'll see you on the road. Thanks to Mike Flynn at Uno Rising Media. Uh, We will see you guys out on the road. Have a great week. 